Good afternoon, I'm Karen Holmes Ward. Later in the program, efforts to shed light on land taken from black families over the centuries. But first, it's no secret that many of this country's bedrock institutions benefited from their investments in the slave trade. Now, according to a new book, there is more to add to the history of how profits from the sale of enslaved people fueled the growth of the American Catholic Church. New York Times writer, author, and NYU professor Rachel Swarm's book details the financial gains that supported many Jesuit institutions. That book is called The 272, The Families Who Were Enslaved and Sold to Build the American Catholic Church. Rachel, thanks for joining us. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Good to see you. So how did priests in the Catholic Church become enslavers? And more, more, moreover, how did they morally justify the buying and selling of people? It's such a good question. And I always like to start by telling people a little bit about who these folks were, the 272, and how the priests got involved. And to do that, I need to take everyone back to November of 1838 to the docks in Alexandria, Virginia, not far from the nation's capital. And if you had been standing there that day, you would have seen them scores of people being loaded onto a ship, forcibly loaded. There were elderly people, husbands and wives, children. These were enslaved African-Americans who had been sold and were being shipped to the deep south, far from the people they loved and the world that they knew. And they had been enslaved and sold by some of the nation's most prominent Catholic priests who happened to be among the largest slaveholders in Maryland. Mm. And when times got tough, they sold these people off. And let's, um, let's, to save. let's, let's get more specific. Catholic priests, Jesuits in the Jesuit area. Jesuit priests. Yes, Jesuit priests. Okay, so how, priests. how did they become involved in, in the slave trade? You know, it was part of, they arrived in uh, the British colonies in Maryland where the Catholic Church, the underpinnings of the Catholic Church were built. Um, and as the economy moved from an economy that was um, one that dominated by indentured servants to a, a slave economy, they transitioned with it and ended up having large plantations um, that supported the priests and supported the emerging Catholic Church. And so not unlike other people during that time, the priests were doing what others were doing in the time and, and, and holding uh, enslaved people. So what did they do with the money from the sale of the enslaved people? And how did they come about uh, deciding to, to sell these people that they were holding in bondage? So, um, you know, they relied on uh, slave labor and slave sales to build a number of important institutions um, in the church. So the first archdiocese, uh, priests who relied on slavery helped build the first Catholic institution of higher learning, Georgetown, um, the first um, cathedral, um, priests who operated uh, a plantation and sold people established the first Catholic seminary. Um, so, you know, this was foundational uh, for the American Catholic Church. And as I mentioned, that 1838, a slave sale uh, helped keep Georgetown University afloat. Hmm. Um, and in fact, this book is an expansion of the research you did for a New York Times uh, article about uh, the Georgetown University situation. You know, the book is titled The 272, a relatively small group of people uh, when you look at the entirety of the slave trade. Uh, but the title of the book makes a sweeping declaration about the American Catholic Church. That's right. And and that's why I mentioned those foundational institutions, that those foundational parts of the Catholic Church. Um, and it's also good to know, too, that, you know, it, it wasn't just those, um, the Catholic Church, but as you mentioned um, in the beginning, other Jesuit institutions, um, Holy Cross College, for instance, um, received uh, money from the Jesuits after that 1838 slave sale. Um, and Boston College received support, um, in not for direct financial support, but the Jesuits sent uh, priests um, and administrators and staff um, so they supported uh, the college and others in that way. You know, let me go back to a question I asked you uh, at the beginning of the segment. How did um, 
these Jesuits morally justify the buying and selling of people. They were, they were supposed to be men of God. Yeah, um, they, they were interesting people in that unlike some white people at the time, they didn't believe that black people were brutes or animals, right? They believed that they were human beings with souls. And they believed that they had an obligation to tend to those souls and nurture those souls. But at the same time, there was no ban from Rome on the buying and selling of black people. So they felt like they could tend to the souls and buy and sell their bodies. It's, it's a contradiction. And it's important to know that there were priests all along the way who raised concerns and questions and even protested um, the idea of selling people. And uh, I should again say that the slave trade was occurring not only in America, but around the world. And uh, sadly, many people were participating in the selling of human beings, not just the Jesuits and the Catholics, other, other religious sects as well, right? That's absolutely right. This was, you know, foundational for the economy. So um, many, many um, religious organizations um, and institutions benefited from this. And we are seeing um, around the country today efforts to grapple with this, Georgetown and the Catholic Church and other institutions, Harvard University, um, municipalities like the state of California. There is a reckoning going on. There was a hashtag uh, GU272 after your New York Times article first came out that revealed the uh, story and what was going on at Georgetown. What happened after that article was published? What was the response? So, um, you know, the 272 was actually a hashtag that students at Georgetown um, coined themselves. Um, they were protesting um, the names of these priests being on some buildings. Um, the story, which appeared afterwards, did have, um, you know, a lot of interest. More than a million people read it. Um, most importantly, I think, was that descendants of uh, the folks who were enslaved and sold learned about their history and started to organize. You know, um, Rachel, talk more about how the story of the 272 touched off a national conversation about the ties that universities have to slavery. Again, not just Catholic universities. You know, you talk about Brown, you just mentioned Harvard, and others are working on plans to try to make amends. Yes, yes, that's right. So, you know, Georgetown was among the first uh, to really grapple with his history. They had established a, a working group to try and look into this even before my story ran um, with the emergence of a descendant community where people uh, were pressing uh, Georgetown and the Jesuits to do more. Georgetown became the first major university to offer, in effect, um, legacy status, preference and admission to descendants and then to establish a fund, a reconciliation fund of raising $400,000 a year to benefit projects to support descendant community. So the conversation continues. Rachel Swarns, thank you for joining us today. And everyone, the book is called The 272, and it's on sale now.